Thank you so much for coming to the seminar today. I see you all very politely have yourselves on mute. So that is excellent and that will make us all very happy in, in the, uh, the seminar. This is, of course, the Research Notes seminar series and it is presented by the Resources, Environment and Development team at the Crawford School of Public Policy. My name is Kat Taylor. I'm hosting today and we have uh, uh, the pleasure of Penny Sullivan, who's going to chat with us. Now, before we oh. get, also uh, would like to acknowledge country, wherever you are. I'm here on Yaru country at the moment. And to pay respect to elders past and present um, all over these unceded lands and waters that are now called Australia. So today for our seminar, uh, as always, or as often, we'll have 20 minutes of presentation by Penny, and that will be followed by around 20 minutes of questions and answers, uh, which I'll facilitate. And in addition to that, I will remind you that this session is being recorded. So if you prefer not to be recorded, um, please, uh, you know, take your camera off. And if you would like to ask a question, you can send it to us in the chat um, if you prefer not to have your voice recorded. And this seminar will go up on the Crawford YouTube channel at the end. So to more formally introduce Penny Sullivan, she is the Sir Roland Wilson Scholar and she's a PhD candidate at the Crawford School. Um, it's very exciting to have a PhD candidate present. This is not her final seminar, just so you don't get confused, but it is going to be a fascinating talk as Penny's work and research focuses on intergovernmental relations in federal water management, seeking to understand how state and federal governments pursue their objectives um, in water conflicts with each other. So, Penny, can I hand over to you? Yes, sure. Yes, all right. Uh, Thank you so much, let's get started. Yeah, yes. Um, so, in terms of uh, just work out sharing my screen so you can see slides. Um, yeah, there we go. Uh, that one. I'll share that. And, uh, and you should be able to um, slideshow. There we go. Good, and hopefully. You guys can still see that screen uh, and I can see my notes. Yep, we can, I can see your screen, your PowerPoint. Great, perfect, thanks. So um, before I start, uh, I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from the lands of the Ngunnawal people and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people in the audience today. Uh, to give you a little bit of context for this research, uh, as Kat mentioned, I'm, I'm a fourth year PhD student in the Reed Group at Crawford. Uh, my supervisory panel includes um, Daniel Connell and Cliff Barney, who are both here today, thanks guys, as well as Linda Bockerell from UC and Dustin Garrick from Oxford. But the book I'm presenting to you today isn't uh, my exit, uh, my whole thesis, but rather one small observation that's emerged from my work. Um, just one small part of my findings that I'm hoping to share with you and hopefully get a little bit of discussion and feedback on. Um, I will note that because this work is part of my larger PhD research, it is a bit more limited in scope than if I'd researched uh, just the topic of drought driving water reform separately. For my whole thesis, I'm particularly looking at cases of federal intergovernmental relations over water policies, um, particularly in cases of overlapping authority federalism, where no one government can really act unilaterally. Uh, but if I was to do further work in the sort of drought driving water reform space, I'd obviously seek to broaden that scope um, and in other cases and in other sort of circumstances. The other important distinction I, was, I would make is that I am looking at 
water resource policy change. So I haven't looked at water quality cases and I haven't looked at changes to drought policy like welfare payments for drought affected farmers. Um, so obviously there's some overlap when we're talking about drought driving water policy reform, but I've mostly just looked at the water resource policy side of things. So, um, go. Um, a little bit of an overview of what to expect from my presentation today. In the interests of time, I'm intending to be quite brief about how I outline the, the literature and the framing of my research and my methodology. If that's too quick for you, feel free to ask me some more questions at the end. Happy to go into more detail on that. Um, I'm going to spend the bulk of my time talking about the three cases that I studied. Uh, obviously, I won't be able to cover everything, so I've tried to focus on just what's relevant to this question about drought driving water reform. Um, but yeah, hopefully we'll have some good time for discussions at the end. Uh, so, getting straight into the literature, uh, drought is widely considered one of the major catalysts for water resource policy change. Sayings like never waste a crisis and we can't do water reform if it rains are very common amongst water resource management practitioners as well as in academia. I've been a little facetious here with my headings, obviously. Very few academic papers take such a simplistic approach of drought equals water reform or drought doesn't equal water reform. But I do notice that there's a wide body of water management literature that does assume that drought will catalyse water reform uh, and be one of the major, if not um, main, catalyst of water reform. However, many of those papers are specifically looking for responses to drought. So if you see a drought and then you see a policy that's designed to address the drought shortly afterwards, it's very easy to assume causation, but obviously that's not necessarily, um, correlation is not necessarily causation. And what's more, if you start out by looking at responses to drought, you're probably going to find them. Whereas if you start from the position of looking at the water reform uh, and then examine it from a historical perspective to identify the factors that drove it, you tend to find a more complex picture. And that's what um, Tubi and Ulibarri and Scott um, have both been writing about more recently. Um, the other criticism that I have of many of the, you know, drought catalyzes water reform studies, and the Birbel and Esteban paper I've quoted there is a very good example, is that many of them rely on public statements and policy announcements from politicians in a quite uncritical way, which, I mean, everybody who's, uh, who's ever lived in a democracy knows that politicians can be a little economical with the truth sometimes, uh, especially when they're talking about why uh, the justifications for their policies. So, yeah, there have been a few more recent studies at Tuvi and Ulibarri and Scott study um, that challenge that dominant narrative. Uh, and these studies usually start with the reform and look backwards for causes and drivers of that reform. And those studies tend to find a much more complicated picture. So I am framing uh, my research and the sort of questions I'm hoping to discuss today are uh, what drives governments in federations or multi-level systems um, which are like federations to agree to joint water reform and how do drought and water scarcity crises contribute to that agreement. Uh, so methodology, I've taken a critical realist approach uh, which recognises the complexity of the system and the inability to observe some things directly. Uh, and that relies on abductive reasoning to identify what the most likely explanation is for the observations. And that's an approach that's increasingly being used, particularly in water literature in, in a lot of more recent studies over the last couple of years. Uh, I've used comparative case studies of three cases of water resource policy agreements in overlapping authority situations uh, and used a lot of qualitative semi-structured interviews with decision makers. So water resource planners, high level public servants, politicians, NGOs, stakeholders and, and media. Um, I've also supplemented that with some document analysis of meeting minutes, agreements, media statements, that sort of thing. Um, 
Um, but in terms of my analysis, I've examined it uh, using some of the critical junctures methodology, which is looking at particular moments in time when actors' decisions are more impactful and longer lasting than usual. Uh, so I've identified those critical junctures by noting clusters of activity uh, and decisions and um, where, you know, where obviously a lot's happening. And then asked not only what's causing that critical juncture, but what people are doing within it to take advantage of that critical um, anybody sort of familiar with the public administration literature will probably be um, familiar with that kind of concept uh, described as policy windows uh, and, and similar sorts of terms. So for my cases, I selected three cases based on them being uh, developed economies and pluralist democracies in arid to semi-arid environments. So they're dealing with water scarcity specifically. Um, but also cultures with strong histories of agrarianism and agrarian cultural sentiment. And as I've mentioned several times, in federations or federal-like systems. So I've got an example in Spain here. Spain itself uh, is not technically a federation, uh, but I'm actually considering it as basically a state in the European Union, which is um, in the federalism literature increasingly being described as as a federation and certainly for the purposes of water management they operate as a federation so I've treated them like that. Um, yeah. So um, my three oh three cases were uh, the Hucar Vinalopo water transfer project in Spain, um, the Colorado Basin drought contingency plan in the United States and the Murray Darling Basin plan in Australia. I will mention that in my larger thesis, I've actually narrowed that um, basin plan case down to just a portion of the basin plan because it's, it's quite large and complex. But I'm going to try to stay fairly high level today, uh, so I'll talk about the basin plan more broadly. Um, likewise, for the Hukar Vinalopo water transfer project, it was part of a, a larger, bigger national hydrological plan that included the Ebro scheme. Uh, so I'll sort of more be talking about that higher level um, example today. So <clears throat> uh, the National Hydrological Plan and the Hukar Vinalopo Water Transfer Project. Uh, and this is a case where critical drought really did help catalyze the government, the Spanish government at the time to announce the National Hydrological Plan. But as I'll explain, it then stalled quite badly. Um, so an ongoing drought in Spain in the 1990s created the conditions to prompt the Spanish central government to develop a national hydrologic plan. The national hydrologic plan was a cohesive plan of water infrastructure works designed to modernise the water supply system in Spain. Most of that modernisation involved building pipelines to pump water from the wetter northern rivers to the drier irrigation areas in the south and east of the country. One of those proposed pipelines was the Hukar Vinalopo transfer project. Uh, the project would have supplied additional water to irrigators in the Alicante region, reducing their reliance on the overused groundwater resources of the area. Uh, it, the project overall, the National Hydrological Plan project, linked very closely with the then Prime Minister Jose Maria Aznar, uh, of Partido Popular, which is the conservative party in Spain, and his plans for nation building. Um, Prime Minister Aznar described the plan as an act of solidarity between Spain's regions, and so tied it very heavily to this idea of uh, a united Spain. Um, importantly, Aznar was the first conservative sort of right-wing um, prime minister after the Franco dictatorship. And Franco had been well known for building water infrastructure, including many large dams. So building more large scale water infrastructure was a way to build on and capitalize on that legacy. Aznar had also agreed to step down at the following election when he announced this plan. And he discussed the National Hydrological Plan with EU officials as an important part of his legacy after leaving office. And he use those sort of terms and phrases. Um, the National Hydrological Plan was adopted by the Spanish government in June 2001, but it needed around $15 billion in European Union funding for the scheme. Um, 
in the end, only 100 million was approved for the Hukata Vinalopo transfer alone, and the rest was abandoned. Um, and the large, large part of the reason for that is that the plan contravened the EU Water Framework Directive, which stipulates the protection and improvement of the ecological quality of water bodies, which uh, taking water out of those water bodies is, is obviously not going to do. But the EU, uh, the European Commission, didn't feel that they were in a position to just say no, flat out, because that would have led them down a path to court, which wouldn't have been supported unanimously by the e EU commissioners at the time. So it would have started a political fight that they um, weren't really prepared to have at that point in time. So instead, they stalled for time by repeatedly asking for more information. And that a, was a deliberate tactic that I've had confirmed. Uh, so um, they stalled until the critical juncture, which was actually the 2004 election, which was preceded by the Madrid bombings, which influenced that election quite strongly. Partido Popular lost the election and the Socialist Party formed government. And one of the first things the Socialist Party did was cancel the National Hydrological Plan. So I've got a, uh, a slide here that's, um, that's a bit messy. I'm not going to go through all of this sort of map of factors and influences uh, in detail. It's mostly here just to give you a bit of a sense of where drought is in the, the lower left there that I've highlighted in red. Uh, as part of a much bigger and, and much more complex um, picture uh, of drivers and factors. Um, so drought was clearly one of the drivers for the National Hydrological Plan policy, but it certainly wasn't the only one. Other political factors like desire for nation building and legacy were also major drivers. Strong desire for economic growth in the more conservative South um, likely also a driver. Uh, the drought itself was also relatively localised to southeastern Spain, so it wasn't a pressure at all for the European Union, which um, the lack of environmental benefits of the plan, and, and in fact likely environmental harms of the plan, meant that the plan didn't have the support of environment groups both within Spain or across the EU. And that combination meant that the EU Commissioner for the Environment, at the time, uh, who was Margot Wallström, a Greens Party politician from Sweden and very strongly pro-environment, um, it meant that she could use delaying tactics uh, like just asking for more information all the time, until popular opposition from the plan in Spain built and until the 2004 election. This strategy worked because the status quo suited the EU quite well, so they could delay forever if they needed to. Um, by 2004, the drought was over, there was no impending sense of crisis, economic development had continued without the plan, although maybe not as strongly, uh, so the case to continue it was quite weak and had weakened significantly from the original position. They ended up uh, substantially revising the Hukar Vinalopo part of the plan and um, abandoning the rest of it. Moving on now to the Colorado Basin, this is probably the case where drought played the most significant role out of my three cases. It put pressure on state governments to agree to the drought contingency plan in the Colorado Basin, but it was not the only factor. The key intergovernmental water sharing agreement in the Colorado Basin is the Colorado Compact. The compact defines how much water the upstream states must allow to flow to the downstream states, but it does this as a volumetric measure, not a proportion. So during droughts, there are often shortages where the agreed volumes aren't available and the upstream states still need to provide that volume out of basically their own share. In the early 2000s, the Colorado Basin began to experience a very deep and prolonged drought, and the notion that the upper basin should bear all of the shortfall quickly became untenable. In 2007, the state and federal governments agreed to a set of water shortage sharing guidelines, and the guidelines included a requirement to develop a drought contingency plan stipulating the actions the states would take if water shortage levels fell below certain trigger points. However, since the guidelines seemed to be working at the time, interest in developing this drought contingency plan was pretty limited. In 2015, 
the first trigger was reached and that requirement to have a drought contingency plan was revived. Wetter winters in 2016 and 2017 allowed storage levels to recover somewhat, uh, contributing to yet another reduction in momentum before a renewed and severe drought in 2018 tipped the basin into crisis point. Uh, several of the state negotiators I interviewed recognised the impact of the severe 2018 drought as something that kept them at the table and held their feet to the fire throughout the protracted negotiations. There was a growing sense of impending crisis, of needing to take action quickly, that helped admin keep administrators and public servants on task. Um, but again, when it came to the actual negotiations, it doesn't seem to have directly created the political will needed for compromise. If drought were the main driver to agree to the drought contingency plan, our, the state of Arizona, you would expect, would be first in the queue, first to agree to the drought contingency plan. Uh, but Arizona has the most junior water rights in the basin. They were the most vulnerable to drought and water shortages. They're also the state with the closest links between water users and decision makers. They're the only state that needs to pass water agreements through their state legislature. Uh, and their main water infrastructure group for the um, Central Arizona project has a board of directors elected by its water users. So if drought creates the political will for water reform because the electorate is putting pressure on them to do something, we'd expect to see Arizona as one of the early adopters of the drought contingency plan. But in fact, Arizona was the last state to get its drought contingency plan agreed. Uh, they were quite laggardly, really. Um, other factors were cited uh, by the people I interviewed as the main levers for getting recalcitrant and laggardly Arizona across the line, most notably a threat of federal intervention. The Federal Water Secretary of Interior, Brenda Berman, made a threat that if the states didn't agree a drought contingency plan by February 2019, she would step in and force one on them. Culturally, that was extremely unpalatable to most states in the United States. Uh, it's also a reasonably believable threat since the federal government had done similar things in the past. But that federal threat gave Arizona administrators a consequence that they could use to get their legislators to agree to their part of the drought contingency plan. If the Fed stepped in, the drought contingency plan would no longer need to be voted on by the Arizona legislature, removing the power of the stakeholders and the legislators entirely. They were also likely affected by drought being a slow onset crisis, and Ulibari and Scott, that I quoted earlier, talked about this a fair bit in their paper. Um, affected stakeholders can feel that because progress is being made, you know, they're, they're going to stakeholder meetings, they're discussing drafts, that they'll get there eventually. So it's sort of okay. The sense of a, a short deadline for immediate action isn't as apparent. And that was echoed by several of the administrators in Arizona that I spoke to. It may, the delay may also be due to Arizona irrigators knowing that they were unlikely to be better off once the drought contingency plan was signed. The, realistically, the, the plan was going to involve some cuts to their water use. Uh, while it was still being negotiated, they could at least hope for a beneficial deal or make the most of their existing water rights. So delay might have actually benefited them, or at least they, they had a bit more interest in it than, than not. The third case is the Australian one, the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. Between 2001 and 2010, the Murray-Darling Basin, along with much of the east coast of Australia, suffered a record-breaking drought, later to be known as the Millennium Drought. It was longer and more severe than any on record. There were extensive environmental impacts, allocations were at zero, irrigators went without water and were unable to grow crops for years at a time, banks started calling in their debts. At one point it looked as though there would not be enough water to provide the city of Adelaide with its urban water supply. There was a growing sense that something had to be done. The then Howard Liberal government was sitting on a large surp surplus that it could afford to spend, and it had a strong desire to find ways to hand money to farmers who needed to be bailed out of unsustainable businesses. 
Prime Minister John Howard was also looking towards his own legacy and the possibility of either retiring or losing the, the election to be held later uh, in 2007. In January 2007, Howard announced that all parties must recognise that the old way of managing the Murray-Darling Basin had reached its use-by date. He requested the states to refer their constitutional powers over water to the Commonwealth Government in exchange for a $10 billion program to improve water efficiency and to address the overallocation of water by managing the basin under a federally developed Murray-Darling Basin Plan. The states ultimately refused to refer their powers, forcing the Commonwealth to instead rely on its foreign affairs power to enact its Water Act. Basically, the Commonwealth said that it needed control over the Murray-Darling Basin in order to implement the numerous environmental agreements it had signed, like the Ramsar Convention and the Migratory Bird Agreements. However, in practice, and indeed in the detail of the Water Act, the federal government still needs the states to agree to its basin plan in order for it to be implemented. Interestingly, the Water Act and the basin plan nominally had the support of both sides of politics. With the help of the drought, Howard had successfully pitched it as so critical and so vital for helping rural communities that supporting it seemed like a necessity. Of course, at this stage, there were no details about what the plan would contain other than a lot of money for farmers. Implementation is another matter. <clears throat> so development of the plan and negotiation with the states, although largely not with stakeholders at that time, began and ran until 2010, by which time not only had the government changed to the Rudd and then Gillard Labor governments, but the spring and winter rains of 2010 had arrived, commencing the end of the drought. Into this environment, the Murray-Darling Basin Authority released its Guide to the Basin Plan, outlining possible cuts to irrigation water use of up to 50%. Irrigators had expected the plan to help them rather than harm them and were outraged. At public meetings, they held protests, conducted stunts, invited friendly media, and in a particularly notable incident, burned a pile of copies of the guide. Public sentiment quickly turned from something must be done about the Murray-Darling and the state's terrible overallocation to those poor farmers, this is a government agency run amok and is going to kill country towns. The chair and chief executive of the authority were both swiftly replaced. Parliamentary and Senate inquiries were launched and an extensive community consultation campaign was started. Water recovery targets were revised down substantially. The federal government's bargaining position with the states had relied on the crisis of drought and a self-evident case of overallocation of water. With the end of the drought and water allocations returning, the federal position was significantly weakened. When the final basin plan was passed in 2012, it included many concessions to the states and irrigators. The recovery volume for the environment was lower than any proposed in the guide, and the plan included a facility for it to be lowered further by a program of works to try to meet environmental objectives at target sites with less water. The states were still responsible for water planning, even if those plans now had to be accredited against the basin plan. And the implementation timeframe was stretched out to first 2019, then 2024, and now likely 2026 when the basin plan as a whole is due for revision. While drought was a significant driver of the plan originally, even if Howard may have also had other additional motivations, the political will for the generated by the drought largely disappeared as soon as it rained. So looking at three, these three cases, um, some of my conclusions. In all three cases, drought played a role in catalyzing action and providing impetus for governments to announce new water management policies. Drought can create a sense of crisis and urgency, and in a democracy, that sense can make the electorate much more ready to accept extreme actions and a strong argument for allocating resources. It can also make doing nothing more politically unpalatable. However, in the Australian and Spanish cases, the drought element was 
possibly really used as a cover for other more ideological or personal legacy reasons for the policy. And in both the Australian and Spanish cases, implementation of the policy took longer than the drought lasted, weakening the position for change. In the Australian case, that was likely more bad luck than anything else. But in the Spanish case, it was a deliberate strategy of delay by the European Environment Directorate. In the USA case, the drought lasted long enough, or more correctly, recurred in time, to act as a driver to keep states on task. But the state most vulnerable to drought, Arizona, was the slowest to agree to the drought contingency plan. They were also the state with the most direct electoral links between people affected by the drought and their decision makers. I think in part this is because drought is a slow onset crisis. Nothing really needs to be done today, maybe this year or in a few years, but often there's nothing that can realistically be done today to make things better for anyone suffering as a result of the drought. Therefore, as long as the elected administrators can say that they're taking the crisis seriously and continuing to work on it, they seem to get a pass from most electors. This was particularly the case in Arizona, where it was difficult to present the drought contingency plan as offering much that would be a better situation for most of the affected irrigators. Continuing to delay put the pain off, so they were unlikely to be punished electorally for it. My biggest takeaway is that while drought is definitely part of the picture for driving water reform, particularly in a democracy, it's much more complex and nuanced picture than it first appears. The opportunities for reform offered by drought can easily be squandered and drought isn't enough on its own. Other factors, particularly political and ideological factors, need to be taken into account. Well, Penny, thank you so much for that fascinating look into the politics of drought um, and three super interesting case studies. I'd just like to invite the audience to all um, to thank Penny for that great talk. Uh, give the little virtual hands or whatever you like. Thanks. Um, we're running a little bit over time. So I think what I would like to do is um, if people need to leave now, then they can, but let's have about 10 minutes of questions um, from the floor to, uh, you know, till about 12.50 p.m. and go from there. Okay, so... Sorry, I'm a bit over time. That's all right. Um, three pretty meaty case studies. It's hard to cram it all into 20 minutes. Yeah. Uh, like I said, I'll remind everyone that we are recording. If you're comfortable with that, that's great to ask a question. And if you'd prefer not, then pop it in the chat. All right. We got any uh, questions for, for Penny? If you do, please raise your hand. Easy. Thanks, Penny. Um, I had a question, I suppose, about your conceptual framework mm. and where that takes us. I was wondering whether you'd um, thought at all about Kingdon's multiple streams framework, because in a way that offers you perhaps a way of um, making a more systematic comparison between the three cases. So, because then you you could sort of break down, you could break down. Um, your three cases into the problem, policy, politics, we, streams that, that Kingdon talks about and actually compare each one of those, um, I suppose, across the three cases. And so rather than perhaps critical junctures, which kind of suggests anything goes, um, what you've got more, I suppose, there is something like a window and what happens in that window, mm. whether it's politics that supervenes or pre-existing policy or, you know, the definition of the problem. But anyway, I, I don't know whether you'd thought at all about using that. Yeah, I, I hadn't actually, but, um, but in part that's just because of where the rest of the thesis had sort of taken me down. So I'd sort of looked more at the, I uh, started out by looking more at the collaborative water governance sort of frameworks uh, and, um, yeah, and also some of the tools of government sort of frameworks. So in, in the broader thesis, I'm looking, I guess, more at the particular tools and tactics that the, the public servants in state and federal governments look at, um, use 
specifically to try to, to achieve their ends. Um, uh, whereas here I was sort of picking backwards a bit, looking at, at um, uh, particular drivers for, for change. And obviously the things that public servants do is some of that, but not, but not all of that. And sure. yeah, I think these things are connected. Um, but, yeah, it's another way of looking at it. Uh, probably, yeah, something to consider. Just, just bearing in mind, lastly, that, um, of course, the whole thing with multiple streams analysis is the notion of the policy entrepreneur, which mm. perhaps is something that you could uh, link to your work with on the public servants' roles as policy entrepreneurs. Yeah, yeah. I'd um, uh, Actually, one of my supervisors, Linda Bottrell, has done some research on policy entrepreneurs in, uh, in the Colorado Basin, actually. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, it's, uh, it's something to think about, just taking a slightly different angle, I guess. Sure. All right. Thanks for that great question. Do we have some other questions from the floor? Oh, I got one from Colin. Oh, hi, Colin. Uh, thanks, Penny. What opportunities do you see for application of your research by policy practitioners? Uh, yeah, so it's definitely um, particularly looking at, I guess, my uh, broader thesis. I'm hoping that, um, that when I, so part of one of the conditions of my scholarship is when I finish my PhD, I do have to return to the public service. Uh, so really hoping to take that back in with um, a good analysis of the suite of tools and, and tactics that are that are available and, and sort of some of the factors that we we do have a bit of a tendency um, particularly as public service sort of practitioners to assume that we you know this is the way we we do it this is our main lever in Australia we assume that our main lever is money in the US they assume their main lever is federal threats um, you know, it, everybody's kind of got there. This is our one tool. But when you actually start talking to them, and certainly when you start doing these international comparisons, there's a whole suite of tools. And sometimes uh, I think public servants forget that some of these things are tools and forget that they're in their arsenal uh, and don't realise that actually uh, there are things here that can be manipulated or that um, that might be being manipulated against them. And I think there's definitely some lessons there for, for public service pra policy practitioners, but also for um, informed stakeholders and NGOs and other people participating in that policy development process. Uh, I'm really hoping that I can sort of expose some of that and make it more transparent to a broader audience. Got one from Sango. Oh, hi, Sango. Uh, thanks, Penny. You talked about drought creating a sense of urgency and making water a more immediate political concern. Do you know if drought also plays into climate change policy discourse? Ah, this is an interesting one. Um, and I think it's more about the way climate change has been politicised. So uh, climate change was mentioned a couple of times in the US by some of the practitioners I spoke to there, um, particularly them thinking about um, because they, they, the people in the know do know that it's not just the drought. They've got a structural deficit kind of problem. They, they made their Colorado compact in what turned out to be a particularly wet period. Um, they've, that, even on the existing long-term averages, they don't have as much water as they've allocated. Uh, and with climate change, that's likely to be even more of a problem. So they're sort of starting to think about it there. Um, but it never came up publicly as a driver in any of my three cases. Uh, it was really not, not much cited. Um, I think very early in the Australian case, it might have been cited publicly as, a, oh, well, the Basin Plan will help, you know, help us address climate change. And then that was sort of very quickly faded out of the discussion. Um, it, it seems very much like there's a deliberate avoiding talking about climate change. I even got one person in the US uh, because when I was there and interviewing them uh, and through 2018, obviously Donald Trump was the president uh, and had issued those sort of instructions basically to public servants not to talk about climate change. Uh, and I mean, that's the most 
sort of bald and obvious example, but I think more subtly that was still at play in, in the other two cases as well, that we don't really have an answer for this. Politically, it's, it's still a huge question and a huge kind of issue for us, uh, particularly for conservative governments. So yeah, there was a real sense of don't mention the war kind of, you know, just don't talk about climate change. Um, so I thought that was interesting, unhelpful, but interesting. Um, yeah, I think also shows how much, um, how much these debates are framed by the politics of the day. Um, got a couple others I'll try to do. Yeah. <laughs> Look, um, I'm wondering, given that it is 10 to now, whether we might wrap it up, that some interesting questions about climate change and certainly if drought is a slow burn issue, climate change is perhaps even one that can be postponed for, for longer. Um, Penny, are there some final comments that you would like to make or any final question before we wrap up? Um... Oh. I see one about if there's one thing you wanted that you would change about water reform journey on your return to yeah, MDBA. Thought... <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that's probably a good note to add on. I, I think out of the, the research that I've got, um, particularly out of what I've focused on today, is the importance of that political sphere. And I think if there was one thing, if I could only change one thing about the water reform journey for the Murray-Darling Basin and particularly the Basin Plan, it would be that um, that governments and, and people supportive of the, of the Basin Plan really needed early on to be making the case for the change politically um, much more strongly and not just relying on, well, there's a drought, you know, I'm really explaining that this is about more than just this current immediate crisis. Um, and I think I think that was the big failing. I think we didn't, and I say we, because I was working at the Murray-Darling Basin on the Basin Plan at the time, um, not in that higher role, but still, um, I think we didn't make that case politically. You know, there was a real sense of, well, that's that's not really our role. Um, and also that it seemed so self-evident at the time. And I think that was probably a big mistake, yeah. Well, it Great final question and reflections. Thank you so much, Penny Sullivan, for that talk. And thank you everyone in the audience for coming today to the R&D Research Note Seminar. If you like that, then of course, keep an eye on upcoming seminars because Penny's final thesis, um, final PhD seminar will be coming up sometime soon. Do you have a date for that yet? No, not yet. No, Sorry. Um, no, 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 there's no. Yeah. yeah. Well, everyone, you'll just have to keep a close eye out for those emails and see what's coming up. Yeah. So thanks again, and we'll close the meeting for now. We'll see everyone next time. Thanks, everyone.